Our program today is titled Outlook and Farm Policy Moving Forward. Our panelists include Jonathan Coppas, Ag Policy Specialist from here on campus, and USDA Chief Economist Rob Johansson from Washington, D.C. As Chief Economist, a post Johansson has held since 2015, he's responsible for the department's agricultural forecast and projections and for advising the Secretary of Agriculture on economic implications of alternative programs, regulations, and legislative proposals. Mr. Johansson, thank you for joining us today. The floor is now yours. Well, thanks a lot, Todd. I appreciate uh, having the opportunity to <clears throat> go through um, some of the observations that we've seen over the in the various economic sectors uh, related to agriculture. Uh, this is a slide that I showed at the 2020 Ag Outlook Forum in February. It just showed what our most recent forecast was for farm income at that time, showing slightly higher cash receipts expected lower government payments uh, and lower federal crop insurance premium uh, indemnities relative to last year. So 2020, when we were looking at this in February, looked like we were going to see um, a better year, certainly for, uh, for both uh, the crop side and the livestock side. Similarly, let me just go forward here, just showing that uh, debt had been reaching historic levels, but interest rates had remained low, um, keeping interest repayment capacity actually uh, slightly better than we saw last year. Um, and the debt to asset ratio rising slightly, but uh, still um, at a relatively low level, uh, below 15%, uh, and certainly below the levels that we saw back in the 1980s. So again, this is a situation we saw in February. Next slide, well, we, of course, that even in February, we knew about the coronavirus we started to look at how uh, infections in um, Hubei, China, were starting to ramp up uh, through the month of uh, January and into February. And at that time, we did note, of course, that there was a fairly significant impact at first on the Shanghai Composite Index, but that the uh, S&P 500 had continued to shrug off the, uh, um, the coronavirus um, uh, potential for global uh, uh, spread. Now, let me see if I can go for that. was then, and now where are we at today? That was uh, just over a month ago. Um, now we we're looking at uh, forecasts, and this is not this is not U.S. government forecast. This is private sector forecast for the second quarter of U.S. GDP growth. Um, a significant declines across the board. You can see how those uh, estimates, uh, estimates from the different private sector groups has been actually getting a little bit uh, more dire um, the further into March we went. Now we're seeing a significant, um, certainly a significant expectation that second quarter of US GDP will be reduced by as much as 25%. And of course, last week, or in fact, yesterday, we saw jobless, uh, um, jobless claims jump to over 6 million individuals, by far a record over um, last week of over 3 million, um, just showing that, uh, again, the, it's hard to see here, but the S&P index is still relatively high compared to historic, but it has obviously taken a, a big hit. So, um, of course, we're also looking at how the supply chain is being affected for our food, food and agricultural products. Um, here's one indicator, just looking at open table data on hotel re or excuse me, restaurant reservations um, falling dramatically uh, over the month of March. And again, uh, we are seeing more macroeconomic impacts from the uh, the global spread of the pandemic. Um, so even though the US economy is facing some challenges, um, a lot of other market economies are also um, sustaining significant impacts and that's translating into a stronger dollar, um, which will have implications for uh, agricultural trade going forward. If we look at food and ag sector businesses on the market. 
we can see that uh, in some cases they've uh, noted some fairly substantial declines in their stock price. Not in all cases, but for the most part across the board, on average, you can see the yellow bar there for the S&P index almost falling by 20%. Uh, this was through March 30th, 2020. Um, and that's relative to January 1st. Ethanol margins, um, there's a lot to say here about ethanol demand and ethanol margins, but certainly we know that both gasoline and uh, diesel demand have fallen substantially um, with, uh, I mean, I should say despite the decline in price, um, the expectation is, is that there will be uh, much lower gasoline sales in 2020 this year. That has implications for the amount of ethanol that's blended into gasoline. Um, and in addition, we can see here at least that uh, break-even ethanol producer margin at zero has been in the red for most of 2020 and certainly has declined uh, fairly dramatically uh, in the last month. Looking at commodity futures, um, certainly we've seen wheat and rice um, show some strength in the market, but for the other commodities, uh, looking at futures prices, particularly the livestock categories and cotton have declined um, fairly dramatically over the uh, last three months. <clears throat> so here is the mass prospective plantings that came out last week. Um, for survey responses from producers that were administered beginning on February 28th and running through the first week and a half of March. So this was early March responses for the most part from producers on this survey. So certainly there was impacts in the US economy at the time of coronavirus uh, that may have been weighing a little bit on producers' minds when they thought about what their expectations for plantings were. Um, but certainly since that time, uh, so over the past three weeks, we've seen um, a deterioration in some of the commodity uh, outlook for GDP forecast, which I mentioned earlier at the beginning of the presentation. So that being said, uh, expecting a very big corn crop this year, 97 million acres expected plantings, uh, up significantly on soybeans, and that's not that's not to be all that unexpected given last year's historic prevent plant amounts. Um, so we, we did expect more corn and soybean acres, but certainly this would point to a very large corn crop. As I mentioned, since that time, we have seen the corn price strengthen uh, relative to soybeans. So, uh, excuse me, let me reverse that. We have seen soybeans strengthen relative to corn. Um, so the uh, uh, soybean to corn price ratio has inched up since uh, the end of February. Um, and that would suggest that there may be some price signals out there for producers to uh, to go more strong on the soybeans uh, relative to corn, although I'm not suggesting that that is a forecast at this point in time. One thing we can look at when we look at how things have been changing in terms of particularly corn and soybeans, here's what we're showing for the current corn basis through March 27th. Um, certainly we know that the basis is sort of weaker up there in, in the Dakotas um, relative to, for example, um, Illinois. Um, but I've highlighted here uh, in red and in blue uh, where the, the basis is stronger or weaker than we might have expected from a historical comparison. So for example, those blue highlighted areas, um, those counties that are highlighted in blue show where the basis is actually higher, stronger than, than we would have otherwise expected from a 10-year average. Um, and it just shows that in those areas, um, there probably a little corn deficit due to the prevent plant that we saw last year. Not as many in the, of the red uh, highlighted boxes showing um, in those areas, the basis is, is weaker than we would have otherwise expected. Looking at how that corn basis has changed from January, now of course, <clears throat>
basis is obviously a seasonal thing. We would expect it to change anyways. Um, for example, uh, since January, of course, we have signed the, or seen the phase one deal concluded with China that should have provided a positive signal, positive demand over as we moved into spring for um, commodities, and we would expect uh, the basis to strengthen. But what we, um, so we can look at this chart to see if that's happening. And so we have seen actually um, uh, the basis decline in some areas and strengthen in others. Looking at the current basis through March 27th, we have uh, some counties highlighted in red where the basis is weaker than we would otherwise expected and blue um, where prices are were higher than we, we would have thought. Um, just looking at a historical level again, showing um, where we may have seen some deficit relative to uh, uh, as a result of prevent plant last year. Again, how the basis has changed over time. Of course, we would expect uh, more green here as China starts buying more soybeans. And we have seen uh, darker greens uh, showing up, but also some declines in, in basis as well in some areas. Our, um, as of the March WASD, um, we expected uh, record levels of production for uh, beef, pork, broilers, and milk. Um, of course, we would also expect with coronavirus that um, there will be uh, significant GDP impacts both domestically and globally. And I would, uh, we would expect that uh, when we look at this next year, that it's likely that these forecasts will have come down. Taking a look at futures, uh, if we look at that middle column there, it shows the change in the futures price since uh, the first U.S. coronavirus case was documented in January, uh, third week of January. You can see how, uh, by and large, most of the futures prices have come down. Certainly, the cotton has taken a big dip, uh, down 20 cents since, um, since uh, the mid part of January. Um, but again, both corn and soybeans down almost 50 cents per bushel. So uh, this is a chart I would, I would have shown as well at the Ag Outlook Forum. We're almost done here. Um, we did see some optimism at the beginning of the year as the U.S. had signed the deal with China. Uh, we don't have an updated egg barometer from Purdue and the CME. But we do have certainly have seen some declining signals here on the other indices that we tracked, um, whether that be the Dow Jones Industrial Average, uh, the Rural Main Street Survey, um, the housing market starts from the NAHB, um, and certainly corn prices as well. So we would expect that, generally speaking, the egg barometer responses from producers will also track downwards here in the next uh, uh, period. And I'll just end with um, a, a note from what we saw during the 2008-2009 period, last big recession called the Great Recession that affected uh, um, all of the United States. Uh, and certainly it spread to other corners of the globe in 2009-2010. Uh, but what did we see? Um, and I've charted a couple of this tried to take a look at this in a couple different ways. So on the left graphic, we have food expenditures in the United States between 2008 and 2009. Um, and you can see that while it doesn't look like much on the chart, that's still a pretty substantial decline in, uh, in, in food expenditures by American consumers, down uh, about $25 billion uh, in that period between at, at the low point in 2009 relative to where we were in 2008. Let's go over here to the right-hand side, looking at cattle, cotton, and dairy receipts, cash receipts. So again, um, we did see a higher price uh, leading into the recession, higher, sorry, cash receipts, but a pretty pretty dramatic decline there in dairy receipts during the, uh, the height of the recession in 2009. Similarly, a pretty dramatic decline in cattle receipts and also in cotton receipts. Um, I wouldn't say that this figure would look the same for all different commodities, but I think it's fairly indicative of what we might see if not only US, but global GDP 
um, growth slows and uh, or declines um, significantly in 2020. Uh, and then uh, we would, of course, expect a relatively quick recovery following um, the development of um, more uh, treatments and, and such it, moving out into 2021 and 2022. So with that, I took a little bit of extra time, but um, sorry, I got started late. I think that's my last slide. And um, I guess happy to take questions or turn it over to Jonathan at this point. We'll be taking a few questions for you and those who have questions uh, for Chief Economist Johansson can write those down uh, and we'll try to get to some of them, not all of them, of course. Uh, we do have some questions that have been submitted. Uh, so, uh, somebody asked, how will the ag economy digest uh, the loss or at least the production from ethanol plants? Uh, and I'm wondering how much, uh, they were too, how much of the percentage of price of corn is dependent on the ethanol industry? Well, that's always a great question and we, um, look at that quite a bit. Uh, the actual um, price reflection of, uh, of you know corn use and the ethanol grind will change a little bit over time. <clears throat> we would expect uh, as a 10% decline in gasoline sales to see at least a 10% decline in ethanol sales as well, depending on our exports. Now, of course, we we would expect as part of phase one with China that China uh, uh, may have increased its purchases of ethanol. Still too soon to uh, determine whether that's the case or not. Of course, they're also um, still uh, recovering from uh, their coronavirus outbreak and the shutdown of a lot of, a lot of their, um, uh, a lot of their economy, certainly in Hubei province. But for the US, uh, we would expect domestic use of ethanol to fall by at least 10%, over one and a half billion gallons of ethanol down. Um, pretty significant impact on, on that corn supply, particularly if we're looking at planting 97 million acres. I think that's one of the reasons why we've seen corn futures fall by 50 cents a bushel um, in the last couple of weeks. Does the USDA intend to use CCC funds for coronavirus relief? Well, I think Jonathan's going to talk a little bit about this in his talk. Um, and I, I'm hesitant to say too much other than the fact that certainly Congress has appropriated funds for coronavirus. Um, and USDA is receiving um, certainly funds to, to both help agricultural producers respond to coronavirus impacts. Uh, I would say that those funds are slightly different from CCC funds. CCC also received a replenishment as part of the stimulus um, bill, the CARES Act. Um, and uh, you know, normally we use CCC for routine operations uh, for farm bill programs. Um, of course, the CCC was used to, to develop the market facilitation program over 2018 and 2019. Um, and uh, if the secretary is um, uh, uh, feels that the need is there, and Congress uh, also has indicated um, their uh, intention of using CCC funds for responding to coronavirus. Those are certainly things we'll be looking at. It is your thought there at USDA then that the $14 billion is for more than just replenishment of what's already been spent? Well, the CCC fund uh, fluctuates over the space of the year, uh, it gets replenished um, normally uh, as part of regular business operations and appropriations. Appropriations have been um, uh, actually not really running on a routine um, time period. Uh, so those uh, replenishments of the CCC spending authority get done usually as part of a continuing resolution. Um, but Generally speaking, they, the replenishment occurs after we audit the books for the previous fiscal year. And that normally would happen late fall and early, early winter. Um, so the $14 billion replenishment that was given to us uh, was for a number of reasons. Um, and again, I'll uh, leave it to Jonathan to, to cover that in his talk. 
We talked a little bit, or at least you did, about phase one. Is it possible for China to reach that agreement for 2020 uh, regarding buying the U.S. ag commodities? And if you could divide that into marketing year, that might be good. Sure. Um, this is a, a great question. One I got actually um, as the primary question after following the Ag Outlook Forum at the end of February was whether or not China could meet its commitments under the phase one. Um, deal. Uh, we certainly w- were expecting that that they would uh, meet those commitments. Um, so, as you recall, the phase one deal had more than just uh, commitments t- for purchases in them. That also had commitments for USDA technical uh, and regulatory uh, operations to meet with their counterparts in China to figure out some of the SPS issues that we've been working on for quite some time, and uh, that process has been certainly delayed by the inability to have traveled between China and the United States and to meet those staff have been meeting via teleconference over this last three month period. Um, So I guess to your question, is it feasible for China still to meet their phase one commitments? I think it is still feasible. Um, Is it likely? That's um, another question that they would meet their commitments to purchase by uh, the end of uh, December for phase one, um, uh, or whether that will uh, spill over into uh, fiscal or calendar year 2021, um, which also has its, you know, its own um, uh, commitments for purchases. There's a lot of different ways that um, China can meet its commitments. As I mentioned earlier, they could purchase ethanol. Um, they can purchase, um, other livestock products. I know that their purchases of corn and cotton have been increasing recently. So we would uh, still think that the phase one commitments are achievable uh, for 2020 and 2021. I think uh, I think everybody would acknowledge that those phase one purchase commitments were an extremely good signal for U.S. producers. I still think they're an extremely good signal for U.S. producers. I also think that um, there were uh, suggestions that they were ambitious uh, sales purchases, and <clears throat> that was even before coronavirus hit. And I would suggest that I think the observation that there were ambitious sales commitments is still valid. And I would say that the coronavirus impacts are still um, causing uncertain uh, demand in the United States as well as abroad. And uh, it, it would only um, certainly make those uh, phase one commitments. Um, still ambitious and somewhat uncertain as to whether the actual amounts will be met by the end of December. Um, will there be an MFP3? That'll be asked by lots of folks. Well, the Secretary has been pretty clear on this. Um, uh, the, you know, the President has said uh, that if uh, a, a third MFP is needed because of uh, um, that the uh, phase one deal is not being met. That's a possibility. The secretary has also indicated that he doesn't think that it will be needed, but we're certainly tracking the progress on the phase one deal and providing that information to the administration. Turning back to the $2 trillion package from last week, Congress all fit to target uh, the $9.5 billion in what I'll call ad hoc disaster. I'm not sure that's really the right words, uh, aid to livestock and specialty crops. Does USDA have more flexibility to distribute those funds? Yeah, I mean, the spending authority for that $9.5 billion uh, talked about providing agricultural producers with um, support. And um, it then it included some subsets of what agricultural producers could be, but certainly that wasn't an exclusive list. So Agricultural producers is a pretty broad range of, uh, of production in the United States. So um, there is the discretion to and flexibility to be able to use those monies to target the sectors most affected. Is the slide you showed on detailing the most affected commodities by price since January kind one kind of a blueprint for those dollars then? No, those are only prices. They don't talk about sales. So I'm um, certainly as you would all acknowledge uh, being egg economists that uh, any kind of cash receipt or or expected decline in 
revenues would be both a function of price and quantity. Hey, thank you so much. We appreciate you taking the time with us today. We really thank you uh, on behalf of the Farm Doc team for uh, joining us. I know your time's really uh, under the crunch there in Washington, D.C. We have Jonathan Coppice. Hey, good morning to you as well. Yeah, good morning. Just a quick overview of the uh, what's called the CARES Act, the Coronavirus Relief Act that passed Congress uh, just about a, a little over a week ago now. Uh, and we put this out on a farm back article yesterday. So I'm just going to run through some of the main provisions that we see or that are in that that are providing funding uh, through the USDA agencies and programs. And the first line item that we noticed, um, just important kind of reminder of, of some of the work that USDA does, and this was some additional emergency funding for inspectors for meat, poultry, eggs, and plants, uh, grain inspection and audits and whatnot. So those functions, they've, they've beefed up some of these salary and expense uh, needs um, for, uh, you know, overtime and, and, and additional staffing. Also, uh, there's some funding in there for the Rural Business um, Cooperative Service to help uh, provide loans out to rural businesses, uh, as well as at the U Rural Utility Service where they're um, adding some funding to help with telemedicine, obviously uh, a, a big need right now, uh, and broadband issues and trying to help with rural schools to, uh, to keep students moving. Uh, just we'll jump ahead real quick. Just kind of picking up where Rob left off, actually, on the on the two funds and the two chunks of uh, appropriated dollars in the CARES Act. The first was that nine and a half billion, uh, and he pointed out that it's there's a pretty clear signal from Congress, even if it's not exactly uh, uh, you know explicit language telling them how to spend it. That the priority around those funds are going to be for specialty crop and local food systems and farmers markets, getting that direct fresh to consumer. Uh, food and, and vegetable needs, as well as livestock and dairy. So I, I, I think it's, the signal's clear from Congress, but it, it certainly wasn't uh, a, a direct limit on where this could go. So that would leave some flexibility, but having to balance among the various uh, needs out there uh, is gonna be no small challenge. And then Rob also mentioned the CCC, the Commodity Credit Corporation. And uh, there's a $14 billion reimbursement in there. You know, the challenge with the CCC is it's a it's basically a line of credit. Uh, and so they spend at USDA. It's um, there are a series of things that are obligated. And that's what this is trying to just compile a rough estimate of what may be kind of on the books uh, through the CCC. Everything from the second, and third round of payments under MFP, the uh, marketing assistance loan program, which this bill also provided a pushback from a nine month repayment to a 12 month. And then we have the transfers to other agencies, to conservation programs. We've got the ARC and PLC payments, export activity. So quite a bit of activity uh, under that line of credit for the CCC. Um, you can add this up to roughly about $30 billion. So what we don't know, and, and, and I think they're probably still trying to sort out, is kind of how that $14 billion reimbursement uh, works, what, what it frees up under the cap and how much. That's so one of the things we're going to want to watch closely in the coming weeks and months is just how much leverage or how much room they've got under that cap to, to uh, uh, continue providing assistance where needed. And the other uh, major component of the roughly $48 billion that went down to USDA is on the food assistance side. Um, a couple different buckets that this went into. Uh, there's a contingency fund for the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program or the old food stamp program. This is the direct assistance to low-income Americans to purchase food. Uh, there was an additional $15 billion uh, put into a contingency fund there for the use by USDA to respond. We've got additional funding, $8.8 billion for the Child Nutrition Program and a little bit, uh, $450 million for the Commodity Assistance Program. Some of this money is actually uh, allocated out to different sub programs within that but certainly we do see a, an initial push here to get some funds out for uh for food assistance and um I, i've got in here just kind of a reminder of what we saw in the wake of the great recession so rob get, did a good point setting that up um uh, not that long ago uh, just about 10 years 12 years ago when we went through the great recession you know one of the things that we watched at that time was uh, the counter cyclical nature of the snap program and so this is a reminder of what uh what happened is as people lost jobs and lost income, they fell below that poverty line. And so a whole lot more people became eligible for the program, more of them signed up for the program and the costs certainly increased. Um, one of the things we'll keep an eye on is the, the Recovery Act in 2009 and 
increased benefits for families receiving SNAP. And that was not included uh, in this negotiated CARES package this time around. Um, so that may be something we'll see uh, in the next round of negotiations if they, if they come to pass. Um, but certainly this, uh, this is one of those things that, that um, we hope uh, cooler heads can prevail and that we don't get into some of the partisan bickering over this program, given just how important food assistance is to families and individuals right now. Uh, when, when Rob reminded us of about 10 million jobs lost in just the last two weeks, we certainly uh, want to make sure everybody can get food on the table and keep their kids fed. And, and so this is one of those programs that is incredibly vital in doing, vital in doing so. And so we'll keep an eye on how that shakes out as well. And that's just uh, a quick sort of overview of what's in the CARES Act, the $2 trillion uh, bill. Um, Sorry to go through that quickly, but I certainly want to leave time. If we have more questions, I can try to answer uh, those that uh, that are left. And if you have questions, go ahead and put them in the box. We've got a couple of them already in the queue for Jonathan. We would like to take time to thank, though, our Farm Doc sponsors. They include Compeer Financial, Illinois Corn Growers Association, the Farm Credit Illinois, uh, and Grow Mar FS Growmark uh, companies. And thank. You. Just thanks to them and, of course, to Illinois Agri uh, the University of Illinois and uh, Agricultural and Consumer Economics. A couple of upcoming webinars to, to, for you to consider. Uh, next Tuesday, Todd Hubbs will provide the latest outlook on acreage decisions. Gary Schnitke will be there as well. That, again, starts at 11 o'clock. And then on Friday of next week, we'll take a look at crop management. And I believe Emerson Nafziger will be with us on that date. Um, we're putting some of that together yet, so you'll be able to uh, join us for that. Again, thank you for joining us as well. And remember that if you want to find this webinar or any of our other YouTube uh, webinars, um, actually webinars that are now posted to YouTube, you can do that by going to farmdocdaily.illinois.edu. And there you'll look for that YouTube icon and just click on that. You'll find our YouTube channel. Of course, you'll find all kinds of things on the Farm Doc Daily webinar or website as well. So Jonathan, a couple of quick questions for you. What do you think the impact of uh, trade related and now virus related farm payments in the last couple of years have had uh, or will have on the construction and passage of farm bills moving forward. Uh, you've already made some notes uh, about uh, SNAP and what happened in Washington, D.C. over the trillion, couple trillion dollar package they passed last week. Yeah, that is, uh, that's one of the questions. Um, I'd probably spend more time than sanity with, with council uh, trying to sort out. It's just what this all looks like uh, in the next farm bill debate, which is currently scheduled for 2023. Um, it's certainly going to complicate things. Uh, you know, I, I would say that the two, met, two MFP rounds really kind of throw the standard operating issues uh, through a big curve there, uh, just on how those were, were rolled out. And, and I think we still are trying to process and digest exactly what that, what that looks like. Um, you know, and that's, that's not to, to diminish the, the damage that, that some of these trade conflict have done to farmers and the need that was out there in, in many areas. Um, but it does raise concerns about how that how that political effort will operate uh, the next go around in Congress. And then with SNAP, um, again, I just I think we've seen far too much of a of a political fight over this program, given how important it is. And I, I'm concerned with the news reports that we've read around this two trillion dollar negotiation. That if in fact there was again a partisan fight about uh, about this program, I just I worry about what it does uh, to the coalition we need and frankly to just the, the optics and the politics around uh, something that, I mean, next to healthcare, I'm not sure what's more important right now uh, in getting food to people that need it. And so I, I really do hope that, that the, the reports uh, are exaggerated or at least that uh, people have kind of recalibrated and rethought around this because getting food out is, is critical, getting, making sure people can eat is critical. And look, uh, you know, most of farming is about producing food. So these are customers. And um, so I, I don't know how this all plays out, but I think it's really, really uh, adding quite a bit of uncertainty and, and a set of challenges to the, to the effort. Um, but we are a good three years away. So we'll, we'll, keep, we'll keep an eye on it and we'll keep watching things. And staying with that $2 trillion package, um, 
and, and some of the other sides of it. Are farmers eligible for payroll protection payment loans? Yeah, we've been getting that question a lot. The initial read that we have is that farmers are not under that SBA program or the payment protection, but I do believe uh, there's going to be some some push and some um, some efforts around that. And I'm not sure, again, exactly how that's going to uh, play out on the ground. I, it's one of the things we're still trying to sort out. Um, it may depend on how the farm is set up or some aspects of the operation. Um, so I don't have a great answer at this point in time. I did see that uh, I think the initial response was that, that farmers would not, but I don't think Congress limited it. I think there was an attempt to maybe open that up a little bit more. So I would say stay tuned on that and uh, certainly even have patience with the SBA and others as these things get sorted out. I, I don't know that everybody always uh, factors in just how massive of an undertaking something like this would be. Having lived through the Recovery Act at USDA, there's a lot of work that has to go into trying to use uh, these programs and, 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 and this kind of funding is just going to complicate. So, so I think SBA and others are going to need a little bit of patience as they try to work through it and sort out exactly how to make it operate. Uh, it's something farmers should kind of keep an eye out for to see if there's, if there's some flexibility. Do you have any idea about um, when stimulus payments might come, what the timing might look like, and what the nature of those payments might be? You mean the $1,200? Uh, well, let's do Yeah, we can do it with the 1200 but I'm I think those are scheduled to come out in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, I think the $1,200 are expected to come out. At least part of it's coming out here in the next week or so. Um, some of that's going to depend on whether you've got the automatic uh, deposit, direct deposit capability from the IRS. Um, as far as the $9.5 billion that, that Congress appropriated to the Secretary of Agriculture to help with producers, uh, and I think Rob kind of hinted at this, is that I, I think they're still sorting out exactly uh, what where the need is, what is needed. And so I, I wouldn't expect that to come right away. Um, I would imagine they're going to they're going to continue to evaluate the situation and and uh, probably dole that out in, in tranches so that they don't uh, they don't use it up all at once. But I, I would imagine we start to see some initial response efforts uh, in the not too distant future. Um, but again, I, I, it's going to be a tough call to to try and sort out you know which producers and how much and how how exactly you make that assistance available. Any final word from you before we let you go for the day? And thank you so much for taking the time too. Yeah, no, I, I, I think it's just a, a, we all struggle with some of the uncertainty and, 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 and a lot of the questions around this, and we appreciate everybody's patience and as we work through it, and uh, we'll keep doing our best to inform everybody, so we appreciate that. Jonathan Coppas is a NAG policy specialist here on the Urbana campus of the University of Illinois of uh, the webinar series from FarmDoc. On behalf of the whole of the FarmDoc team, thank you for being with us. I'm Illinois Extension's Todd Gleason. You have a good day.